A migration is as ancient as the human story. We are a migratory species, but the current scale, the volume, the urge, the speed of migration is truly unprecedented. And this is fundamentally altering societies, economies, nation, and the world as we know it. Migration is extremely important to Christianity and its missionary calling. The diaspora factor has shaped and reshaped Christianity throughout its history. Welcome to the Lausanne Movement Podcast, where we have a passion to accelerate global mission together. If you like today's episode, won't you take a moment to rate and review our podcast and subscribe? That way you won't miss a thing. And now for today's interview. Dr. Matthew Newman, welcome back to the podcast. It's great to have you with us. Yeah, thank you, Jason. So today we are looking into the shifts in community and intuitively as Christians, we know that community is important. Christ created community. But I'm curious, as we consider the State of the Great Commission, as we look towards 2050, from the State of the Great Commission report, what did you guys highlight? What were you looking into in terms of community and what were your main points and why? You know, as we reviewed these key issues highlighted in the report, it's interesting to notice that there are so many of these topics that are either being challenged or facing redefinition, not just from one factor, but multiple factors at the same time. And this is also true of community. Multiple factors are shaping and reshaping community of our age. You know, it wasn't that long ago in history that the majority of communities were primarily shaped by family structures held together by rural settlements and shared work towards survival. But that's really no longer the case today. Today, the world is primarily urban with more people living in cities than not. And this redefines community structures. And today, there's an increasing amount of migration, whether voluntary, for schooling, or out of need as a refugee. And with so many people not living in their home countries, creating subcultures within new places, this too is redefining community structures. And additionally, today, when many people have traded geographic-based community gathering and are now beginning to gather around shared interests or values in a digital sphere, these virtual communities are now part of the majority of people's lives in our world. And this is also redefining community structures. So Jason, I don't believe this is an understatement, but a key question of our age is actually what is community? With so much of this redefinition going on. It's certainly a question that we need to be exploring as a church, especially as we consider the Great Commission and the mission of God moving forward into our own communities and cities and countries. And so I'd love for us to dive into the data a bit and speak about migration. As you looked at the data surrounding migration, how has migration evolved over the years? And what were some key findings from the reports in this area? Since 1990 to 2020, the number of international migrants has increased in all UN regions. So if we take a look at that movement, Europe, Asia, and North America have been the primary destination of that movement. Specifically, the United States is the largest receiving country of migration by a significant amount. And second and third is Germany and Saudi Arabia, respectively. But on the other side of the spectrum, the highest emigration or moving out of a country is India, Mexico, Russia, China, and others. So it's interesting to note that why we often hear migrants fleeing disasters or difficult situations, actually the most migrants come from middle-income countries experiencing economic transition. The very poor rarely migrate due to limited resources. Even in war zones, this holds true. There's a lot more details here, Jason, but you know, these are a few kind of observations at the top level. Yeah, I think it's interesting to, to look into the data when we're speaking about why are people migrating? Why are they moving from one country to another? Often, as you say, we have an image of someone poor fleeing their country, but it's interesting to know that they are moving for other reasons. One of those reasons is religious migration. And I would love for you just to share a bit about what the report offers regarding data surrounding religious migration, especially concerning the movement of different faith communities. This, this was actually a really interesting one to me as we continue to report on this, on this phenomenon. <clears throat> you know, there's an interesting balance between the dynamic movement, but also this really static bottom line when we consider religious migration. The highest religious migration happens with Christians and Muslims. Hindus and Buddhists represent really a small share of the global migrant population. So let's talk about that a little bit more. For Christian migration, there's a notable movement between regions. We see a large movement from Latin America and Caribbean to North America. We also see Europe as the second highest recipient of Christian migration, 
receiving individuals from Latin America, Asia, and Sub-Saharan Africa. So this is a very dynamic set of movement here. However, it's really interesting to observe that this movement isn't actually changing religious affiliation bottom lines. The loss of Christians in this region are actually being replaced by the Christians moving in from other parts of the world. So at the bottom line, we actually see no religious affiliation changes, total number of affiliation changes due to migration. However, it does shape how Christianity looks. It shapes how Christianity looks in North America and in Europe specifically. So for example, Christianity in North America is no longer a white male faith, but heavily influenced by migration from Latin and South America. Now, if we consider Islamic religions, again, we don't see a lot of bottom line change. Most movements of Islamic individuals is actually between Islamic nations. There's one notable exception with the rising growth of Islamic migration population in Europe. So metaphorically speaking, religious migration is not changing the shape of faith. It's just changing how it's made up or how it looks. One of the key topics that come up when we're speaking about migration is that of refugees. It's a political crisis all over the world. And the plight of refugees is a gospel issue that we need to discuss and we need to dive into. So could you share us what the current data tells us about global distribution of refugees and the challenges that they face? Since 2010, there's been a marked rise in the total number of global refugees. As many of you listening on this call may be aware, the increase of global refugee population continues to be strongly influenced by very unfortunate regional conflicts or geopolitical events. We see this often in the news or in our headlines. And these conflicts cause immense internal displacement and international displacement. So I appreciate the question here, Jason. First, remember that this, these immense challenges, these are immense challenges that people are facing. There are layers here from humanitarian need to massive redefinition of community structures. And really, I hope and pray the church sees these individuals plight and offers biblical hospitality in the midst of these challenges. So urbanization is a major trend. And what does the report reveal about the growth of cities and the shift in population dynamics? Yeah, this is one of the more dynamic ones. And, and somewhat these, this tale has been told in years past. But Jason, it's fair to say that we now live in an urban world. Between 55 and 60% of the world live in an urban setting, and that's actually growing. Now, this is the stat we often hear. We, a majority of the people in the world live in an urban setting. But it's actually interesting to look back and reflect on some of the previous episodes we recorded that much of the storyline of this report and of the future of our globe really is characterized by the rise of Asia and the rise of Africa. So the global north and Latin America were actually really urbanized by the end of the 20th century. In these regions, somewhere between 70, 80% of its population live in an urban area. But this has not been the case for Asia and Africa, but is quickly becoming so. So Asia by far has the most people living in cities out of any global region, and it's just crossing the 50% population mark and still rapidly growing. Africa is also growing rapidly, now on the cusp of being the region with the second largest number of people living in an urban setting. So there's actually a lot of ramifications here to urbanization. And if we look, it's not just global as a majority, but a lot of the regions are emerging into a majority population in the urban region. And some of these ramifications include really great economic growth, uh, like I mentioned before, but also some challenging ram ramifications on changes to things like community structures. And there's so many opportunities for the church to reach people within the cities. But another area that is mentioned in your reports, and it's the last data set that we're going to discuss in a little bit of detail, is that of informal settlements, often overlooked when it comes to research and data, and I think often overlooked in terms of gospel outreach and opportunity. What does the report re provide in terms of these communities and the unique challenges and opportunities they face? Yeah, let me help the listener here first before commenting on this. An informal settlement, as we call it here, sometimes is what we refer to as slums. These are urban environments that fall outside of government control, outside of government regulation or protections. So Jason, perhaps it's because in addition to my role as a missiologist, I'm also an architect, but informal settlements is an immense issue that we have to pay attention to. It's just, the numbers are actually really quite dramatic. In 1950, only about 3% of the world lived in informal settlements. But its urbanism has grown and the infrastructure has unfortunately not kept up. So in about in 2000, about 25% of the world's population lived in informal settlements. And what's even more shocking is many scholars project that by 2050, as much as 50% of the world's population will be in informal settlements. 
That's an enormous amount. I mean, you can look at all the other stats across the world. There's very few things that 50% of the world experiences, let alone a plight like this. So not only is this a challenging to community structures, but there's a huge humanitarian need here that the church should be aware of. And that kind of leads us into the next section of part of the questions I have for you. And it's my favorite time when we get together to, to speak about how we can reflect on this as evangelical churches. So what questions should the evangelical church be asking and how might we adapt our strategies to respond effectively to these global shifts in community? And particularly as we're talking about community, this becomes really important for the church, right? At its very core, the church is the body of Christ, a community. And as the church reflects on the, this changing nature of community, I believe the church should be asking a few fundamental questions here. First, in light of shifting definitions of community, it's key the church asks and pursues a biblical model of, model of community in and of itself. Asking what is community from a biblical frame and really understanding that and living that is key. And, and I think the next one follows from that second. Once we understand that, the second question then turns outward and asks, what can the church do to model a biblical community to and with those outside the church? So based on these findings, uh, I think these are really important and it will help equip the church to learn about their biblical community and also live it out in these particular areas. And what implications do you see for the evangelical church in terms of mission and outreach and communities? Now, I think this is a heart issue in many ways. For anyone that's been displaced, moved countries, or even moved within a country, there's a real loss of community, and that's a real challenge. And that's really underplaying it. And at, at these times, this is the time when the church can reach, disciple, and minister to those without a community. So with the rise of migration and refugees and any of those people who are in need, it just takes some intentionality to visit these fringes of society and, and minister to these individuals. Dr. Matthew Newman, I've really enjoyed this conversation and just hearing a few stats connected to the shifts in communities. Would you take a moment just to share some final thoughts in terms of the church's role in addressing the challenges and the opportunities in terms of the global shifts in community? Thanks, Jason, again. I always enjoy speaking with you. My final thoughts, I want to return to this original thought that I opened with. Community is being redefined by more than one factor. And the redefinition of community is very multifaceted and very complex as we can see. Yet there are such great depths to the biblical idea of Christian community. So the complexity of the situation shouldn't stop any individual church organization from being and offering community in Christ's name. Right? If anything, this is desperately needed in our age. So I encourage the church to understand and live out community. Matthew, thank you so much for giving the time to our podcast audience. We truly appreciate you. Dr. George, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Jason, for having me. Uh, greetings from Chicago. It's so great to have you with us today. We are in the middle of a series where we are exploring the shifts that are affecting global Christianity. Specifically, we have been looking at the State of the Great Commission report. And today, we are looking at the shifts that have affected and are affecting communities across the world. We have displaced people. We have people immigrating from one country to another. And it's in this globalized world that we live in. It's happening all day, every day, any and every reason under the sun. And you are the catalyst for a diaspora. And we're going to unpack just what that means as we go along in the podcast. But before we get there, Sam, you grew up in the Adaman Islands and you were part of the St. Thomas Christians. I would love for you to share a bit of your experience with us and how that influenced your faith and your understanding of Christ and your understanding of community, which is what we're going to be speaking about today. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. My parents come from Kerala, which is a southwestern state in India, where an Apostle Thomas brought the gospel in the first century, AD 52. So it's a very ancient, historic Christian community, uh, one of the oldest in the world. It is harder for some of my Western colleagues and friends to come to terms with the fact that my forefathers were Christians before there were any Christians in Europe or many, many centuries before America was even discovered. And uh, so soon after India became independent in 1947, there were no jobs in that state. And he went to the nearest city. And then somebody said, get on a ship and you'll find a job on the other side. So he landed in one of the remote places in the Indian Ocean, a group of islands, several hundred islands, 
called Andaman and Nicobar Islands. And uh, then he subsequently went back to India, got married to my mom. And so I was born in the islands. And, uh, you know, so all my childhood, my dad's job uh, moved every few years. And so then we moved from school to school. Then I finished, uh, left to mainland India to study, uh, you know, do my engineering in a city called uh, Chennai, uh, Madras. And uh, subsequently, you know, moved to the U.S. and joined an American company, traveled all over Asia and the Pacific. And so that's how I get interested in migration. My forefathers and their migration story, our community's migration story, and my own wandering through life got me interested in studying people in different places and God's people in different places and studying scripture and understanding how movement of people is consequential to Christianity and the mission of Jesus and his kingdom vision for the ends of the earth. Wow. Thank you for sharing a bit of the introduction and a bit of where you get your passion from. Before we move on, I, I mean, I've never met someone who's been part of the St. Thomas Christians. Could you just share with us what defines them and what, how is that different to so many of us who are listening to this are part of evangelical churches? What would you say we share in common with the St. Thomas Christians? And, and what would you say, say is so different, something that we might be able to even learn from them? I think uh, one is, you know, I mean, they, uh, you know, hold on to the lineage and and the faith of the, you know, the disciple Thomas, who took great risk to come to the furthest corners. There was a Jewish settlement in that part of the world in the first century, maybe even before time of Christ. There were Jewish settlement in that part of the world. They were trading in spices across Middle East to Alexandria and Rome. So during those settlements, so Thomas, uh, after the last one to, you know, kind of make his affirmation to the risen to the Christ among the disciples, and he wanted to go to the furthest, that's what the story tells. And he goes to the furthest settlement of the Jewish people to tell that the Messiah has come. And we saw him, and he died, and he rose again. And so he wanted to tell the story of Christ to the furthest scattered Jewish community which happened to be in southwest corner of India. And so they came, I think he came in uh, history and tradition tells that he arrived in AD 52. Karanjan Noor is a southern coast of present state of Kerala. And uh, then he was martyred for his faith in AD 72 in the city of Chennai, uh, where I did my studies engineering. And uh, so there's a mound there called St. Thomas Mount. It is believed that that's where he was feared. But subsequently, when the church was thriving in Damascus and Antioch and, uh, you know, Nineveh, uh, many, many missionaries from the Syrian Christian tradition and from Iraq and Syria uh, came and sent missionaries and pastors uh, for several centuries. And uh, so that's why they followed a tradition of liturgy and prayers, much of that in Syriac much like Greek and, uh, you know, Latin was the language of Christianity in the West. Syriac was the language of Christianity in the East. And I think uh, oneness holding on to that tradition and uh, sustaining community and preserving faith over many generations. But then that was the, what is traditionally known as the Orthodox Christian, Indian Orthodox Christianity. And uh, then it goes through a reformation, much like uh, European reformation, in Germany, there was a Reformation moment some 200 years ago, and they came, Marthoma Church. Uh, so I belong to the Marthoma tradition. Marthoma means, Mar means saint. Thoma is Thomas, uh, Marthoma Church. So my roots go back to the Marthoma Church, which is a Reformed evangelical tradition, a Bible-believing, yeah, evangelistic for social justice and very involved in the community. So they have one of the very educated community. Uh, so lots of education came. They were also healthcare and some of those uh, innovations and reached that community because they were Christians and many of them got scattered all over the world. So highly educated community, very literate community. All of them is uh, because of the benefits of missions and Christian worldview had come to our community. And so we'll find many, many teachers, professors, doctors, nurses, scientists, and uh, engineers and uh, economists. And yeah, so there's lots of learning. And as a result, they also got scattered worldwide. It's one of the most dispersed community out of India. 
Wow, thank you so much for just sharing a bit of your own background. I loved how you connected your own background to the thing that you're so passionate about, which is diaspora communities. One of the first times I heard the term diaspora was through Luzon. And so I would love for you just to define it for us and define for our listeners what do we mean when we're speaking about diaspora communities and why they are significant in terms of today's global context. Yeah, the word uh, diaspora is a biblical word. It's a Greek word. It first appears in the Septuagint, the Old Testament translation into Greek. It is an agrarian term, agricultural term. It's like a farmer taking a handful of seeds, going out to the ground and then scattering it. And uh, so it's kind of dispersion or scattering. And it came to define the dispersion of the Jewish people who lived outside in foreign lands. First, uh, during the exile, they were taken to the Babylonian Babylon. And so they lived there. And, and then subsequently, the Roman Empire and the Greek and Roman Empire, many of them got scattered across the wider Roman world across the Mediterranean Ocean in North Africa, West Asia, Southern Europe, and uh, West Asia. So we see that scattered community having a common identity called diaspora Jews. And so traditionally, it was offered, offered to Jewish community who lived in the places other than the Jewish homeland. But subsequently, it has been applied to the Armenians, to to the Greek and Africans and Chinese and Indians. And so we today broadly used anybody who lives outside uh, of their traditional ancestral homeland. More number of people are living in places other than where they were born than ever in history. And all of them would be part of our diaspora community. So we say it is not just an individual. When one person goes from one place to another place, we call them migrants or immigrant for the country out of which they are going, immigrant with I uh, to the countries into which they are arriving. But when we talk about multiple generation, multiple places, and multiple transit points, multiple modes, uh, multiple socioeconomic political categories under which they arrive in a, you know, a, a different a set of places. So it's a little more complex, so like a network. Some go for economic reasons just to find a job, or some go for harvest in another place. Some go for studies. Some are forced to go because there's a war going on, or there's an economic collapse, or there's an ecological crisis, which is forcing people to go and find life and livelihood in a land other than where they were born. And so all of this collectively we call, use this word diaspora, and diaspora is a major theme in the redemptive mission of God and the Christian history and the biblical story. And diaspora was identified as a strategic focus area at the Cape Town Congress in 2010 in the, within the Luzon community. And there are other Christian communities who have been focused on migrants and community of refugees and others. But within Luzon Circle, it was in the early 2000s, conversation began importance of the migration as a theme. Then in 2010, I was there in Cape Town when it was launched. I was part of the research team, researching and providing data as a subject matter expert. I was writing my doctoral dissertation at that time. And so I just churned out a lot of data for them. And so they, six years later, they invited me to come and take on the charter and lead as a catalyst for the migration and diaspora track uh, for the Luzon and for the global church. It's been exciting. Nine years I've been serving in this role, traveled to some 60 plus countries, every corner of the globe, every major issues to political issues to seminaries. I teach at a university and college. And so I've been kind of in the, had in the forefront uh, of action of seeing what God is doing, even through uh, a crisis like refugees. I went and lived in, you know, stayed in refugee camps and spoke at United Nations to the White House, to places and churches and communities and helping them to understand and having a heart for uh, people who are displaced. Uh, whatever reason, uh, it's an important story for Christians to understand and the world to understand because this is reshaping our world as we know it. Well, thank you for just bringing a bit of a framework to our conversation. And I, I really hope that we can pull out some of those stories that you've 
even just mentioned briefly as we've gone through. So let's dive into the State of the Great Commission report's findings on the shifts in community. I'd be really curious to hear from you. What specific shifts in community stand out to you the most from the report? And what stats should the global church be paying particular attention to, especially considering the way that you framed it being part of the redemptive story of God in the world? Could you share with us? I mean, human migration, you know, it's a defining issue of our times. Uh, it is reshaping the world order in terms of economy, in terms of what's happening in the world. And all of them is getting redefined in some way. So it is important for us to understand the seed. And uh, more people living in places other than where they were born. And this is fundamentally altering societies, economies, nation, and the world as we know it. Yet this is not a new thing. Migration is as ancient as the human story. We are a migratory species. But the current scale, the volume, the urge, the speed of migration is truly unprecedented. Migration is extremely important to Christianity and its missionary calling. The diaspora factor has shaped and reshaped Christianity throughout its history and will continue to do so now. So that's why we study scripture. We study the current movement of people and understand the story of God's people when people are on the move. So in the Lausanne circles, we say people on the move as a descriptive phrase that includes all kinds of displacement, migrants, asylum seekers, international students, displaced people internally, internationally, trafficked, expatriates, climate migrants. So all of these categories are inclusive. And all of them who are marked by some form of displacement. If you, your ancestors were displaced from some context. So in the U.S. context, I say a century later, after the Protestant Reformation, we see massive movement of Europeans all over the world. They went to Africa, they went to uh, North America, they went to Australia. So this movement is what we call as a great European migration. Some 60 million Europeans went all over the world because Christianity was growing there and they got scattered all over the world. And they also made Christianity look like a European or a Western religion. And so now, where, because this is the important aspect, where Christianity grows, it pushes his people out. They will go places. And so that's the very nature of Christian faith. You will get unhinged from the geography or the culture. You will get to have make friends and connect with people in other places. And so the charter to go to the ends of the earth uh, is innate to the Christian gospel because it is not something that we do. It's not some of the economic or political condition that is forcing people to go. God is sovereignly orchestrating moving to people. It is a God who determines our place and a time where we should live. Acts 17, uh, Paul in his address to Ariopagus. So God is behind the movement of people. And so then I would say that God himself is on the move. It's not the people are on the move, but God is on the move. A static, stationary, a stoic understanding of God is idolatrous because the God of the Bible is a God who is on the move all through the scripture, because he's a living being. And then I read also scripture. Nearly all the biblical writings are diasporic, meaning they are written by, to, for, and about migrants and their descendants. They were originally composed, edited, developed, preserved, distributed, interpreted, translated, and read in the context of some form of displacement. Its authors, original readers, carriers were migrants or their progenies who lived as minorities in foreign lands. All major characters, narratives, plots, settings are shaped by displacements of all kinds. The need to translate the Hebrew Old Testament scripture into Greek arose in Alexandria, not in Jerusalem, because the subsequent generation of Jewish settlers in Alexandria and Egypt, they lost the language of Hebrew. They become Hellenized. They become Greek dominant. Second, third generation, this happens. And so they felt that their scripture, their holy scripture need to be translated into Greek. And so they engage and making the scripture available in Greek. And so we need to understand the story. So much of the New Testament is written in Greek and not in Aramaic. That was the language of Jesus. Not in Hebrew. That was, you know, the holy language of the scripture. And the idea of mobility 
comes within the Christian gospel right from the coming of Christ. Christ himself is displaced. Incarnation, we call it as a divine displacement. So we see the story of God in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, and the current movement of people. It is important to Christianity, understanding the growth and spread and the nature of Christianity in itself, because our God is a God who is on the moon. And that's why people are moving about and God is orchestrating and God is behind the movement of people and the church should take a closer look at understanding those who are coming from around the world to live in our neighborhoods and to understand what they bring. One, they are most of them are Christians. And so how can they be part of your Christian community and expand your understanding of your Christian faith? And second, if they are not Christian, they will become increasingly interested in Christianity because Christianity is truly a global faith. It's a universal faith. And right from the beginning, it's not something that we have achieved here. Uh, but we are living in some truly unprecedented times in the human history and history of Christianity because there are Christians in every country of the world today. So when you become Christian, they will move to go, go places and they'll connect with Christians in other parts of the world because you have this universal uh, solidarity and understanding of our faith. So they will connect with Christians in other parts of the world and they will go to places. And so understanding God and God's work and mission, as we call it, in the world and where people are moving about, I think all of them is intricately interconnected. And so we need to understand the story of God and what God is doing by moving people. Because all missionaries are migrants, just like all migrants are missionaries. At least they carry out a missionary function by geographically and culturally displacing themselves from one place to another place. So this is part of the story of God and what God is doing in the world. And so it's important for us to understand. So as we prepare for Luzon 4, we've been preparing this Great Commission report, the state of Great Commission in the world. And one of the big things they're finding is the shifts that we see in the community. One of them is migration has emerged as a major theme. So I've been working with a team of scholars and practitioners from around the world in preparing this report and understanding urbanization. What is urbanization? People moving from rural places to the cities. Most people in the cities are living in slums. And more people are moving across the border. More prices of refugees. More people and in international students. Some million international students just arrived in America. This, this academic year. Because a couple of years of COVID pandemic has you know, come down. Now it's bounced back to record levels once again. So looking at the international students, Refugee crisis, we just crossed 100 million people who are forcibly displaced. And uh, all of them is very, very important to Christian story and what God is doing in the world. I would like to dig into that just a little bit. You know, as we look at the report, we see that from the 1990s to 2020, the number of international migrants increased in all regions across the world, with a couple of countries receiving the most uh, in terms of immigration, United States fivefold more than all the other countries in the world, uh, 50 million, Germany, 13 million. Uh, we have Saudi Arabia, Russia, and United Kingdom. Many of our listeners come from these regions of the world that are receiving immigrants, as you refer to them, people on the move. And so I'd love to hear from you, what opportunities and challenges does this present to the local churches within those spaces? And where have you seen local churches do really well in terms of engaging people on the move and introducing them to the redemptive story of God, and perhaps even taking that redemptive story that they are bringing from their own Christian backgrounds into their new communities? Remember, I think, you know, this is a global phenomenon. Uh, it appears in every region and every country of the world. People are moving about. Uh, either people are coming from other parts of the world or people from your own neighborhoods in your city and your villages are moving to other places within the country and, you know, and around the world. Asia is the largest continent, some four and a half billion people. And India and China alone is some, you know, nearly three billion people. Asia is also the most immigrant sending region. And they are also receiving most number of migrants too. It's not everybody is arriving in America or Europe. But within the Asia country, America is the most immigrant friendly country, the most immigrants land here, not because of the policy, sometimes illegal, sometimes border crossings by a variety of ways. But America is an immigrant nation. 
In all of its history, it has always drawn immigrants from around the world. But it's also Christianity is growing. And so the other major shift in the global Christianity, those we say, is shifting of the center of gravity of Christianity, as my professor Andrew Waltz used to say. So Africa, Latin America, and Asia has become the new centers of Christianity. They're with over uh, 700 million Christians in Africa and uh, some 600 million in Latin America. Because as I told you earlier, where Christianity grows, it pushes its people out. And uh, much like what happened in Europe, you know, 40 years ago. And so we see a massive out migration from Africa and uh, within the continent first, and uh, then to Asia and Latin America, and then also to Europe and North America and Australia and New Zealand. And uh, so Africa is a major uh, sending of migrants and refugees and diaspora communities. And in France, uh, some of the brightest and the young men and women from Africa are landing in Europe and North America, uh, but also to China. We are seeing record number of Africans going to China to study because they are offering a lot of scholarship in science and tech and other economic and other business fields. But we are also seeing massive migration out of Latin America because growth of Christianity in Latin America, they are connecting with their brothers and long lost ancestry to places like Spain and Portugal, you know, and Greece and Europe, where population is declining. They are trying to replace their declining population with immigration from other parts of the world. But also a crisis. Uh, Ukraine war, Russia war has pushed out more than half the country from Ukraine into Eastern and Western Europe. Much like what happened in Syria a decade ago, the war pushed out nearly 60% of the entire population out. And we are seeing another war in Israel and Palestine region, which is pushing a large number of people and creating instability in the region. But also economic collapse in Venezuela. A large number of people were left. Their financial and the currency devalued, and they were forced to go. And similar things are happening in Argentina. And now the new political establishment that just came up this last week, and they are trying to see and resolve the devaluation of the currency and massive inflationary pressures. But then there are other um, you know, survival issues. When some islands are going under the water, like in the Pacific Islands or the Caribbeans, they are all an existential threat. And so they are forced to go and find higher ground in some nearby islands or nearby states or other countries. So many of them are landing up in Australia from the Pacific Islands, finding shelter and refuge in those nearby countries. So massive fluxes happening all over, maybe whatever the reason be. But Asia and Europe is where the most number of immigrants are arriving. And so there becomes an important factor. So we track United Nations annual report on international organization of migrants. They come out with an annual global migration report, uh, which tells every country that are sending migrants and every country that is receiving migrants. So every two years, they capture the number of people who are arriving. But that's just the migrants for the year. But then the subsequent generation who are born and raised in those places that they've immigrated to, uh, that is also in part of the diaspora communities. And so diaspora is multi-generation. Migrants are one generation and one directional. This is like crisscrossing from many places to many places, through many places, for many reasons, one of them complex a web of relationship is what we call as diaspora communities. And so second, third generation is an important story because who is Moses? Moses is fourth generation Hebrew growing up in Egypt who become God's deliverer uh, for his people in leading a million people out of the bondage in Egypt to the promised land and uh, through Joshua who took over the leadership and led them into the land. But we see those kind of phenomena. Who is Paul? Apostle Paul exceptional missionary of the first century, but we see he grew up in Turkey and he was a Roman citizen who studied in Israel, in Jerusalem, under Gamaliel. He was called to ministry in Antioch, in Syria, and he traveled all over the place and shared the gospel. Because displaced people has a unique sense of calling 
understand and identify with a God who's on the globe and connects with this God and then becomes an amazing evangelist, advocates, missionaries for wherever and people that they meet along the way and the places that they go to. So it's a missionary force. Migrants are a missionary force. And God is doing something by, you know, mobilizing so many people to be on the move and to go places geographically across geography and cultures. Dr. George, I'm, I'd so appreciate the imagery that you have brought into this conversation of our God being a God on the move, who's a God of the people on the move. And I would love to hear, how have you seen diaspora communities reshape the spiritual landscape of communities that they've moved into? Are there any stories of of transformation, of God's people on a move, moving into new spaces that bring revitalization, renewal, transformation. Many, many stories out there. Some of the recent travel across Europe and dealing with the refugees exposed me to the reality how God works through even what we call as the greatest humanitarian crisis on the planet. In 2016, I was in Germany when uh, the Chancellor Angela Merkel said, we are dealing with the greatest humanitarian crisis. And she let a million people in. And so one of the family that I met was this young boy whom I met in Bremen, Bremen in Northern Germany, uh, at a conference that we had organized for refugees. Uh, 90% uh, were from Iraq and Syria, and, and they were Muslims. And I met this young man who just had a very dramatic encounter uh, with Jesus and had a vision of Jesus uh, coming and saving him. Uh, when his own family, several members of his family were shot and killed by the terrorists. And uh, his mother, yeah, he was only, what, 14 years old at that time. They asked him to run, leave home. Otherwise, they're going to come after you and recruit you to be a, a killer like them. And so this mother didn't want her son to be a terrorist. And he runs through the sand several days and eventually, you know, collapsed and was about to die and got caught by the terrorist, and they thought he pretended that he's dead, and they buried him under the sand. You know, he thought this is the end of his life. So, sometime past midnight that night, or the third night of running away from home, trying to find shelter, and his mother had asked him to run northward. He was from uh, south of a city called Aleppo in Syria, which is the nerve center of terrorist killings and shootings. In you know, this is way back in 2018. Uh, 2019. And yeah, so three days he is collapsed and he's buried under the sand and middle of the night, Jesus just appears to him, calls him out by name and pulls him out and then gives him a charge that you're not going to die here. I'm going to take you to a new place. I want you to study my book. So yeah, miraculously, you know, within a couple of hours, he travels some 200 miles and reaches the Turkey border goes and seeks asylum, and because of his exceptional behavior, uh, optimistic outlook and positive attitude, the United Nations the Refugee Commissioner writes a recommendation letter for him. He was just 15 years old. He's a smart young kid. And then guess what? Germany just picks him up and takes him to Germany. So he was in Germany, and, you know, and first Sunday he goes to a local church, asks him the book, Isa book, Isa Kitab. He wanted the book of Jesus because when Jesus appeared to him, he said, read my book. And my pastor friend who did not know Arabic, he reaches out to an Arabic pastor. They get him an Arabic uh, Bible and he pours several hours each day reading the story of Jesus. And he's such a firebrand. He tells about Jesus to everybody in his community, in his church. You know, 80-year-old grandmas and German grandmas are now excited about Jesus hearing about the story of Jesus who appeared to this boy, 15-year-old, in the midst of a war zone in Syria. And these are the stories of how God is at work. And we know a story of a young girl who was drowning in the Aegean Sea. And uh, Jesus comes walking on the water and pulls, him out, pulls her out of the water and puts it back into the boat. And they reach us back to Greece. And their experience of faith and uh, Jesus is so real to them, and their commitment, their resolve uh, has something to instruct all of us uh, in the West, and all of those who are seasoned Christians for many years. They bring new passion, uh, new revelation, and new vision about the Christian faith, 
and they will set your pew and your pulpit on fire. But, you know, we need to hear these stories of men and women who are forcefully displaced, who have had dramatic encounters and new believers. Because wherever there are new believers in a church, uh, there is a new sense of vigor and enthusiasm with the congregation. Some of us who sit in the pew and warm the pews Sunday after Sunday need to hear the stories of young men and women and old men and women who are catching visions and fresh revelation and fresh encounter with Jesus. Jesus is on the move. Uh, Jesus walked on the water, not just back then. It is not just a Sunday school story. It is a real story. He's still walking on water. He's still rescuing people. He's still appearing to people and drawing people to himself. Uh, our God is a, a living God, and we need to be caught up with that moment of God and to be people move with God as agents of his people and as ambassadors of his kingdom. Dr. George, what advice would you give to Christian leaders listening to this? They hearing you unpack the stats about diaspora, people on the move, and they're hearing stories of, of transformation and they're starting to consider and starting to wonder, well, there's, their community is diverse. They can see dispersed people within their own space. What advice would you give them as they begin to reframe and consider perhaps God has a mission for them within their own city to connect with and engage people on the move? Yeah, I would say that, you know, we recently, the Zan diaspora team prepared a document, a position paper what in Luzon we call as the Luzon Occasional Paper, so NOP, which is on the people of the bull and God on the bull. And we just got produced. We took over a year. A dozen of us from around the world had worked on this document in preparation for L4. That may be a document for you to understand and digest this complex phenomena of diaspora and the movement of people. Second, understand your own city and country. Yeah, see who is coming from where. And how can you engage? Because all of us in our neighborhoods, people next door or in our backyards, there are people from other parts of the world. And so we need to become conscious and aware and understand that there are Christians among them. Not everybody is, you know, coming from other faith or, you know, other cultural background. You may not know the language. They may do Christianity in a different way, a different style. They may sing different songs. And their Sunday rituals and practices may be different, but they are Christians, nevertheless. And to understand that our Christians from other parts of the world who are coming. We need to see that we are not the missionaries, but they are missionaries to us. How are they saving us? They are saving us to diversify my understanding of my faith and to include people from other parts of the world uh, in my understanding of my church, global church. Your local church may be very homogeneous. Everyone looks just like you. Same hair color, skin color, same socioeconomic profiles, political affiliation, or whatever that is. But to understand that the church is global, it is very, very heterogeneous. Heterogeneity is a part of the DNA of the church of people of God. Uh, that began in first century. And so that is at the very core and understanding of our church. So the people who are coming from other parts of the world will help me to broaden my understanding of the faith and the mission of God from the ends of the earth to the ends of the earth. So mission is not something from the West to the rest. We say mission is from everywhere to everywhere. So this global missionary engagement. So more global you are, as your church, your understanding, uh, more globally connected you are, more globally engaged we will be, and more globally relevant your faith will be. Thirdly, I would say there are desperate people who are running for their lives. Have compassion, open your home, your sanctuary. Uh, what can you extend? Some help, a shelter. Hear the story and how they survived. If they have landed up in your neighborhood, they have definitely seen a hand of God sustaining them through some treacherous journey across the Mediterranean Ocean, across the deserts of the Middle East, across African jungles and wildlife, across the borders, across Central America and the gangs and the warfare, they have suffered much. They have experienced, are experiencing a lot of trauma. Uh, having a heart for broken, hurting people, uh, that's the ethos of Christianity. We always cared for people who are on the margins. So whether they are refugees or asylum seekers or internally displaced people out of a political conflict or economic crisis or ecological dynamics, forced to leave their home. And uh, what does it mean to experience hospitality, provide welcome, provide encouragement, 
That is the ethos of Christian mission all through his history. And in 21st century, when there are a record number of forcefully displaced people, I think the Church of Jesus Christ needs to rise up to the opportunity to engage them because many of them will join your congregation and will become ardent followers of Jesus when they see Jesus-like compassion and love and charity at our end. And then finally, I would say this is an emerging issue. Continue to engage at Lausanne is here to offer help. We have an amazing team of people and scholars, and we also connect with the church worldwide in many different areas. And we are here to help you, and we be happy to connect with your church, your denomination, your seminary, introduce some courses on global migration and diaspora Christianity, diaspora mission and world Christianity. So read and study. I've written some dozen books. There's lots of literature coming out in this area called Migration and Diaspora Christianity. And I hope for some of this would be helpful for you as you explore and think in terms of how you want to get engaged with the issue of migration and diaspora and communities in the world. Well, oh, Sam, thank you so much. This has been such an informative and inspiring time as we've engaged on this topic. I'm sure that there are going to be people who are keen to take you up on that offer of finding out more. So where can people find you as we bring this podcast interview to a close? Can you share where people can find you, where they can find out more about you and your work, um, more about what Luzon is doing in terms of diaspora communities and people on the move? Can you point them to certain places? The best place is go to Luzon.org and uh, search for diaspora and uh, look for the latest position paper. We have quite a bit of resources, several videos and position papers and classroom materials that are available. They could use any of these materials and find other resources. And also globaldiaspora.com. That is the website of the Global Diaspora Network, which is the official issue network of diasporas for the Luzon people on the move. And so there are lots of resources and connections and linkages there with scholars, institutions, churches, and denominations. And uh, we'll be happy to come alongside you and help you understand and learn and engage uh, this changing communities of the world as a result of a massive level of displacement. Uh, in the next uh, three decades, we will see more people move than previous three centuries. And so by 2050, we are projecting some massive number of displaced communities. So all of us will be affected by this reality of movement of people, what we need to see the hand of God behind it and see how we can be a part of the solution rather than seeing this as a problem in the world and to try to eliminate because God is on the move. Thank you so much for sharing those resources. I'll be sure to put that into the show notes for those who are interested and they can find that very easily in the podcast description. Dr. George, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for sharing all the knowledge that you have. I feel like we just touched the surface. I feel like we could have gone on for much longer as we unpack this topic. So thank you for your time. Thank you for adding value to us, helping us think differently. And I'm trusting that through this whole conversation, we as a global church would be able to move forward and accelerate global mission better together. Better together. Thank you, Jason, for all that you're doing. Appreciate that. Let's continue to crank and look forward to and for what God would do with Lausanne and through Lausanne to get the global church to moving together, together, moving with God. Blessings on you. Thank you, Jason. Keep up your good work. 